The why is uh, when I was a child and teens and all that, uh, we would go for drives, so I sort of became interested in roads that way. And then this is the interesting part, I've said this before, we had a grand, my, one of my grandfathers, my mother's father, lived with us in Brooklyn. And he was retired and uh, spoke very little English. He was from, from Europe, from Eastern Europe. But he liked to, on the weekends, go for rides on the New York City subway. And he took me along. And I guess before I was 12 or 13, I probably knew the whole New York City subway system by heart. We went out to the ends of the lines and went back. We weren't going anywhere. We were just riding. So I think between those two things, I kind of, that was why I got interested in, in transportation. And uh, then the how is, uh, I did a Bachelor of Civil Engineering at City College of New York, and then I did a Master's program at the, the Bureau of Highway Traffic at Yale University. And between those two things, and then coming to the Port Authority and getting hired by the Port Authority in their Traffic Engineering Division, that kind of explains the why and the how. Well, there are, I worked on a lot of projects, obviously. I was with the Port Authority for 36 years. And, uh, but the two things I think that uh, would stand out in my mind, for, and they both, as it turned out, they both occurred in the same year. One was in August and one was in December. In December of that year, December 1970 actually, uh, we put into place the ContraFlow exclusive bus lane on the Lincoln Tunnel approach, uh, which is something that had never been done before and uh, is still in service more than 40 years later. But it kind of led to other areas doing the same kind of thing, bus lanes, HOV lanes, eventually managed lanes, those kinds of things. So I think that was one of the, one of the things I was most proud of. And the other would be the, impl the implementation of one-way tolls. This is way before Easy Pass and electronic toll collection. And so we, uh, the Port Authority and two other agencies at the time, the Thruway Authority and the New York State Bridge Authority implemented one-way tolls on the six Hudson River crossings and on the five, no, I think it was, I think there were five or six additional crossings up the Hudson River uh, on one day in August of 1970, and uh, that was kind of a major accomplishment. Well, I, I like to think about the things that I accomplished, but I like to also, I know about the things that I didn't get done, uh, that didn't get done. For example, uh, we tried to do in the, in the 70s and the 80s, going to Kennedy Airport, what we call the JFK Transit Way, which would have been a busway uh, on the uh, right of way of the inactive Rockaway Line in Queens. We had many community meetings. Uh, I couldn't go into detail on the reasons it didn't get done, although I will mention that later the New York City Transit Authority tried to do a subway line there. They tried to reactivate it. It had had Long Island Railroad service until 1963. Nobody was able to do anything in there, and it's still sitting there inactive. Uh, meanwhile, the Port Authority built the air train to Kennedy Airport a few blocks over on the Van Wyck Expressway. Well, I think I can mention a couple of things that are unique and some of the shared with other areas. The major thing which stares right at you is we have two states. It's a bi-state region. And the other thing is there are a lot of water crossings, um, rivers, bays, uh, Jamaica Bay. So there's a lot of bridges and tunnels. Uh, now, there are other areas that have bridges and tunnels, pr pr primarily bridges. For example, the Boston area, the San Francisco area. But the difference is that you don't have the two states. It's that combination that gives you a lot of the quirks, you might say, of, of this area. Uh, also, the, we have two rivers. We have the East River and we have the Hudson River. Of course, the East River is not really a river. It's a tidal strait, but I'm getting too technical at this point. But we, we think of it as a river. And, but the difference is on the East River, we have some crossings that are toll, some crossings that are not toll. But uh, on the Hudson River, we have all toll crossings. And that's a difference almost in the mentality of people. When you decide to take a trip, if you're in the boroughs, um, you want to go from Manhattan to Brooklyn, you have some alternatives that don't involve tolls. Whereas if you're driving, you're going to go to New Jersey, there's always a toll. And it has an effect on, on your trip choice, I think. 
people think of the interstate highway system as, you know, connecting uh, many, many, many states, for example, I-95 that goes from, let's say, Maine to Florida or Florida to Maine, and depending on which way you're going. But actually, it's not understood that most of the trips are not very long trips on the interstate system. But I'm familiar with a study that was done in Long Island, for example, on the Long Island Expressway, which is I-495, and the average trip length is about 12 miles. That's, you know, it's the typical trip length is a short trip on the, quote, interstate system. So that's one of the myths. Then another myth which has a lot of impact on planning, actually, in this region as well as all over the country, as well as probably internationally, is that if you have high projected passenger volumes for transit, you always need to use a rail facility, whether it's light rail, heavy rail, commuter rail, whereas in fact, in many ranges of transit volumes, bus, bus rapid transit, rail, light rail, there's a lot of overlap. But the fact that that perception, I call it, you can call it a myth or a perception, uh, gets elected officials and planners to look at certain alternatives, whereas they may not even look at other alternatives. So it has a real impact, even though it's what I call a myth. Um, another one, elevated highways cause uh, depressed areas near them cause social and economic ruin of the areas that they go through. I think it's a myth. I'll give you some examples. It depends on what the communities are. Some examples in this area. We take the Brooklyn Queens Expressway going in the areas of Greenpoint and Williamsburg in Brooklyn. Uh, it's an elevated highway with trucks. It's an interstate route, Interstate 278. And yet that area is enjoy, uh, and has never gone downhill. It's always been uh, an ethnic area, Italian, German, Jewish, uh, and they're building hotels, they're building boutiques in that area now. It's, it's a place where the rents have gone sky high in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, so it's an elevated highway. Now, how does that fit the myth? Another area in this area that defies the myth, if you will, is the South Street Seaport in Manhattan. Uh, you have the elevated FDR Drive right next to the South Street Seaport. I, as far as I know, the South Street Seaport is thriving, uh, attracts a lot of tourists, attracts a lot of activities. And maybe it would be better if the FDR Drive wasn't there, but the FDR Drive is there. And it's a thriving area. So I look at that as a little bit of a myth. Uh, it depends on what you do under the elevated highway. I, I, you, can go, you can look at the uh, Brooklyn Queens Expressway in the area near the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Brooklyn. And that's a horror underneath. There's parked cars, it's not maintained well, it's dirty. And so it depends what you do under the elevated highway. Another myth, monorails are a solution to everything. And I can show you many areas, I cover this in some of the courses I do, uh, where conventional transit, whether it's bus or rail, can has many, many of the benefits of monorail. It can be quiet also, depends on whether it's steel wheel or rubber tire but doesn't have some of the disadvantages of monorail, for example, difficulty in switching. Monorail is great in some of the applications like Disney World or Disney, uh, Disneyland, where you have a uh, back and forth, you don't have a lot of switching involved. So monorails, to me, is a myth uh, in the fact that it's the solution to everything. And then finally, <laughs> this is really my opinion, uh, the Cross Bronx Expressway destroyed the Bronx. That's in the power broker, it's everywhere. It's taken as a given. It's not a given. Now, I, I was born and raised in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. The Bed-Stuy area of Brooklyn, I don't know, I can't talk about how it's going right now. It's probably undergoing a renaissance right now. Uh, but the Bed-Stuy area in Brooklyn in the 70s, 80s, maybe into the 90s, was as depressed an area as anything you can find in the South Bronx. Uh, burnt out buildings, all that kind of thing. No major highway has been built or is proposed in the Bed-Stuy area. What caused that area to go downhill, to use that term, just like the South Bronx went downhill? I don't know. There were many socio socioeconomic factors, other areas, single room occupancy. I could, I'm not a sociologist, I can't tell you, but all I'm saying is I think the Cross Bronx Expressway, whatever its problems, has gotten a bad rap. That's all. Uh, there are some differences. Clearly, um, 
Long Island, for example, is very dependent on Long Island Railroad in terms of transit into Manhattan. Uh, New Jersey has its commuter railroads, of course, New Jersey Transit, but it also has a very extensive express bus operation, which you don't have from Long Island. Westchester is sort of in the middle. It has its commuter rail, Metro North, it has some express bus operations. So there are some differences there. They share a spread out pattern, what, what people have referred to as urban sprawl, uh, which was developed um, you know, after the development of the highway system. I think that what they all have in common is they need to develop more uh, activity centers, nodes, if you will. They have some. Long Island, for example, has Mineola. Uh, uh, New Jersey has Newark, Hackensack. Westchester has White Plains. These are major activity centers in themselves, but they need to develop more activity centers, maybe based on the shopping centers, and then they need to develop good transportation systems. Clearly, uh, from starting at the beginning of the 20th century and into the middle of the 20th century, into now and into the 21st century, you had everything focused on Manhattan CBD, everything focused on the Newark CBD, on the Brooklyn CBD. You had a radial pattern of travel into those areas, particularly for transit. And now, the major, one of the major changes is the development of reverse commuting. Uh, you have people from New York City working in Long Island and Mineola and jobs in the suburbs. Uh, same thing from Manhattan going out to New Jersey, let's say out to the New Jersey waterfront, to jobs in Hoboken and Weehawken. So that has had, had to be taken into account in planning of transit as well as in the highway system. It, it affects the peaks. The peaks are in different directions. The peaks are more balanced, those kinds of things. This is going to reflect probably my bias being at the Port Authority, but I do think that the Port Authority bus terminal and the Lincoln Tunnel, that's it, that is a system. Lincoln Tunnel being directly connected to the Port Authority bus terminal and handling probably the highest bus passenger flow in the country, certainly, and maybe in the world, is underappreciated. That system is underappreciated as a transit system, not just as a highway system. For example, the number of transit passengers across the Hudson River coming into Manhattan in the peak period by bus coming through that system is the highest of all the modes coming across the Hudson River. In fact, the number of passengers coming across the Hudson River by transit, by bus, through the Lincoln Tunnel Port Authority bus terminal system is higher than the combination of all the rail transit passengers in the rail tunnels. So I think that is not fully appreciated. Another thing about the region in a totally different area is our marine terminals. Port Newark, Port Elizabeth, the Brooklyn Piers, uh, the impact on the economy of the region of the marine terminals has not always been appreciated. I don't know if it still is, although now with the channels deepening programs, the need, the billion dollar project to raise the Bayonne Bridge to get the ships into Port Newark and Port Elizabeth, maybe that's changing, but I don't think it's always been, been appreciated. Well, we've had technology changes in the past, of course, things like Easy Pass and electronic toll collection certainly have made major impacts. Looking to technology, I think that we're going to see probably more of that type of thing, electronic tolls, not just at bridges and tunnels, but on the highways in general. I happen to believe that we're going to eventually, we've resisted it so far, we're going to get into more congestion pricing. We uh, had proposals by Mayor Bloomberg to do congestion pricing in Manhattan. That was defeated politically. Uh, there, are, there was a proposal by uh, the county executive in Nassau County, uh, Tom Swazi, a couple of years ago. He surfaced an idea to make the Long Island Expressway, which has HOV lanes, to turn them into HOT lanes, high occupancy toll lanes, as has been done in a number of other areas in the country. Four days later, the proposal was dead politically. The vehicles of the past, you drive now, if you go back to the 40s and the 50s, the New Jersey Turnpike was opened in 1950, and it had a speed limit of 60 miles an hour. That was a big deal in those days. And now, if you drive at 60 miles an hour on the Turnpike, they're going to run up your, your rear. 
Uh, and part of that is that the automobiles themselves have become so much better, quieter. You drive with the windows closed. That was You always drove with the windows open. So if you were driving at 60 miles an hour then, you knew you were driving at 60 miles an hour. The noise, the, the tire rumble. Now you drive at 60 miles an hour, you hardly think of it. So there are all these technology changes that have certainly changed transportation. And of course, we've got more automation now. Things that detect vehicles to your side, things that stop you automatically. Eventually, that will, of course, lead to automated highways. When? I don't know. Maybe not in my lifetime. All I can tell you is that in 1959, at a place, I don't think it's still there on Route 1 and down in the Princeton area, the David Sarnoff RCA Center for Research, I sat in an automated vehicle with nobody driving it on the campus. It was a demonstration. The technology was there. It's much improved now. The problem then and the problem still is institutional policy. Uh, if you're an automated vehicle, what about insurance? Who's responsible? Is it the vehicle owner? Is it the system operator? It, these policy and institutional features are still going to be problems, but the technology is being developed, there's no question. It's very easy to fall into just dealing with theory, dealing with the output from the computer, from your models. These are very good. But you also have to have an appreciation for how things really work in the field. You have to know what the, the glitches are that could develop from that. And so, for example, in my case, uh, I got into first into transportation operations. I was in traffic engineering. I, I managed the sign shop and things, very kind of prosaic, plebeian kinds of things. But then I got into the planning area and planned different things, such as the bus lane and uh, one-way tolls and highway interchanges. But when you're planning a highway interchange, for example, it's very helpful, very important to know how things really work in the field. An example, um, there's a new concept in highway interchange planning. We've had for years, we've had what are called diamond interchanges. It's a very common type of interchange. But it's a kind of interchange that requires when you get off the highway and make a left turn, you're in effect going through two intersections and you're getting into conflicts with other traffic streams that necessarily, that don't necessarily have to happen. So someone has developed now something called, <laughs> we have so many acronyms. We have the DDI, the Diverging Diamond Interchange. And it's an interchange where you cross traffic over, you actually run traffic in a, I'll call it an English system or a British system. In other words, instead of keeping to the right, you keep to the left, and then you're able to make your turn and it reduces the amount of conflicts. It's a very interesting and innovative idea. I think you're gonna see more of them, the diverging diamond interchange. There's also something called the, another acronym, the SPUI, the S-P-U-I, the single point urban interchange, which also is aimed at reducing conflicts. And those are alternatives to the diamond interchange. And they came out of people looking, getting deep into the patterns and inter intersections and trying to figure out a better way to do it. And that comes from looking at the actual operations and not just looking at the theory. And that's kind of a point of advice I would give.